This is a follow-up to a recent video I made on how to reduce CPU power limits to reduce CPU temperatures. Check that video out if this topic interests you, but you don't know exactly how to go about limiting power to your CPU. In this video, I will discuss how reducing CPU power will impact performance, with a lot of data that will be useful for determining how low you might want to reduce the power limit for a given CPU. I will focus on Intel's recent Rocket Lake and Comet Lake platforms, and AMD's Vermeer platform. I plan to do follow-up videos to this, featuring AMD's Cezanne platform, and Intel and AMD's upcoming platforms as well. Because I think this data can be very useful if you are building a fanless or other low power PC. The goal of this testing was to determine how well optimized different CPUs are to low power use, and to determine recommended low power limits for each of the CPUs tested. I am coming at this topic from the angle of configuring completely fanless PCs, but the same principles can be applied to other cooling solutions for the purpose of reducing fan noise, better utilizing inexpensive and less performant coolers, or just reducing power for the sake of reducing power. The settings I will be changing here are Intel's short duration and long duration power limits, and AMD's package power tracking via BIOS. On the Intel side, the package power time window was kept at 28 seconds, and when the short duration power limit was used, it was set to double the long duration limit. For the rest of the video, I will refer to Intel's long duration power limit as PL1, Intel's short duration power limit as PL2, and AMD's package power tracking as PPT. My test setup included the Fractal Design Meshify 2 compact case, Noctua NHP1 CPU cooler, Asus ROG Strix Z590A and B550F motherboards, 64 gigabytes of 3200 MHz memory from Mushkin, a 120 gigabyte Western Digital Green 2.5 inch SSD, a Seasonic Prime Fanless PX450 power supply, and an Asus Fanless GT710 graphics card to remove some of the package power going to Intel's integrated GPUs. The latest version of Windows 10 was used, and Passmark's performance test was used to quantify CPU performance at each power limit, from 35 watts at the low end to 125 watts at the high end, and at 15 watt intervals in between. I performed the CPU test twice for each power limit, and used only the maximum of the two runs to reduce the impact of any odd results or missed tests. Starting off with Intel's Comet Lake i3, we can see that the power limits, all the way down to 35 watts, did very little to performance. Only in multi-threaded performance, when PL2 was also restricted to 35 watts, did we see any impact. This is because the i3 will not use much more power than about 50 watts, no matter how high the power limits are set. For comparison, I added the average result reported to Passmark for the i3 10105T CPU, which has a 35 watt TDP. We can see that the 65 watt TDP version of this CPU, manually limited to 35 watts, still performed significantly better than the T series version. The T series i3 appears to have no benefit here, and we are better off by manually limiting the power of the 65 watt version to 35 watts, or whatever other power level is desired. Next, since I did not have any Comet Lake i5 or i7 CPUs to test, I skipped right up to the 10-core 20-thread i9-10900. This CPU has a default TDP of 65 watts. We get a much nicer curve with this CPU, since it can easily pull more than 125 watts when stressed. The difference between the blue line and the orange line here is PL2. For the blue line, PL2 was set to be equal to PL1. For the orange line, PL2 was set to double PL1, so the CPU was able to take advantage of higher turbo boost frequencies. If you are wondering where the green line is, it is right behind the yellow line. PL2 made no significant difference to single threaded performance, all the way down to 35 watts. The manual power limit adjustments line up nicely with the default settings for the T and K series CPUs. 
the 10900T has a lower bass frequency, and the 10900K has a higher bass frequency than the standard 65W version, but it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. The 10900T actually has a higher default PL2 than the 70 watts that I set for the orange results, so it is not surprising that its multi-threaded score is a little higher, and its lower bass frequency explains the lower single-threaded score. The 10900K has surprisingly little difference than the 10900 with a 125W PL1 and a 250W PL2 manually set. Moving on to Intel's Rocket Lake platform, these are the results for the i5-11400. Yet again, the single-threaded performance was unaffected by the power limit. As long as we maintain a higher PL2, it looks like we can get maximum performance from the i5 with an 80 watt PL1 or higher. If we set PL2 to be equal with PL1, the multi-threaded performance is much more affected by the power limit reductions, and it benefited from the power limits being set to 100 watts or higher. Once again, the T and K series CPUs performed similarly when PL1 was set to 35 watts or 125 watts respectively and the single-threaded differences can be explained by the base frequency differences. Here are the results for the i7-11700. I can't explain why the orange and blue results are so close at a PL1 of 35 watts, but the tests were repeated and this is what I saw. Finally, we see a drop in single-threaded performance here at 35 watt PL1. I did not see a significant leveling off here as the power limit increased, so with this CPU, the higher the power, the better, even above 125 watts. Unfortunately, Passmark does not have a reported result for the i7-11700T, but it did have plenty of results for the 11700K. And we again see that if we increase PL1 to 125 watts, and PL2 to 250, they will perform very similarly to the 125 watt K series version. Lastly for Intel, here is the i9-11900. The Rocket Lake i9 is almost identical to the i7, but with higher boost frequencies. Oddly, its performance didn't match up very closely with the i7 for me though. The i9 performed better at the higher power levels, but worse than the i7 at lower power levels. The single threaded performance was a little better here though, and like the i7, it dropped a bit at 35 watts. The Rocket Lake i9 is clearly not very well optimized for 35 watts, and it really only makes any sense to use at the much higher power levels. Passmark did have some results recorded for the 35 watt TDP 11900T, but they don't appear to be accurate, so I did not include it here. Interestingly, the 11900K does not seem to do as well as my 11900 did here, at 120 watts for both single and multi-threaded performance. Maybe I just had a CPU from a good production run, but given how expensive the K version is, it probably makes sense for many people to just increase the power limits on the standard 11900, if the Rocket Lake i9 makes any sense at all. Alright, now let's move on to AMD's Vermeer CPUs. Unlike Intel, AMD does not provide a short duration power limit. AMD's PPT is a strict power limitation that the CPU will not exceed, even for short periods of time. The Ryzen 5 5600X has a TDP of 65 watts, and it seems to do well with a PPT of 65 watts or higher. Lowering the PPT to 50 watts has a significant effect on performance, and lowering it further below 50 causes performance to nosedive. Single threaded performance took a small hit at 35 watts, but was stable at 50 watts or higher. My suspicion is that the large performance impact at 35 watts is due to AMD's chiplet design requiring significant power for communication between the chiplets. The more power required for basic CPU function, the less power is available to the cores themselves. So far, it looks like AMD's Vermeer platform is not very well optimized for low power use, but it performs very well at mid power levels. Here are the results for the Ryzen 7 5800X. 
the Ryzen 7 TDP is increased from the Ryzen 5's 65 watts to 105 watts. The CPU mark curve here looks very similar though, so I wouldn't put much focus on the TDP. Like the 5600X, the 5800X performs very well at 65 watts or higher. Its performance significantly drops at 50 watts, and it's just terrible at 35 watts. AMD does produce a lower power Vermeer Ryzen 7 with the 5800 non-X at 65 watts, but its performance lines up perfectly with the 5800X when limited to 65 watts. If you can't tell, the 5800 CPU mark result is right on top of the 5800X result. The non-X version has slightly lower base and boost frequencies, which explains the slightly lower single-threaded performance. The non-X version is only available to select OEMs anyway, so if you are interested in a lower power Ryzen 7 CPU, it is good to know that you can get the same performance by limiting power manually to a 5800X. The Ryzen 9 5900X shows the optimal power level for performance moving upward from the 5800X. You probably want to keep the PPT at 80 watts or above here, to not sacrifice too much performance. The performance of the Ryzen 9 at 35 watts is even lower than it is for the Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5. The Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 CPUs have just one core chiplet die, or CCD whereas the Ryzen 9 CPUs have two CCDs. More CCDs means more power for communication between the chiplets, and even less power for the cores. If you disable one of the CCDs on the Ryzen 9, the 35 watt performance suddenly jumps up from a bit lower to a bit higher than the performance of the Ryzen 7 at 35 watts. Of course, performance here is still way too low for this to make any sense to actually do. Just like with the Ryzen 7, AMD also produces a non-X version of the Ryzen 9 5900. It has a TDP of 65 watts, and initially when I saw the CPU mark of the non-X CPU, I thought it might actually be a better optimized version of the 5900X for lower power use. Unfortunately, Overclocker Scatterbencher tested the 5900 and found it to use more than 65 watts even with Precision Boost Overdrive disabled. There is so little information available about the 5900 that I was not able to confirm exactly what the CPU's stock power limit is. But we know that it is higher than 65 watts. It might be 88 watts like it is for some of AMD's other 65 watt TDP CPUs, and where it would line up closely with the performance of the 5900X. Finally, we have the Ryzen 5950X. The 5950X created a very dramatic curve here for multi-threaded performance. It actually goes all the way down to zero at 35 watts because Passmark could not complete the whole CPU mark test. It was able to complete the single-threaded test though, and its result was about equal with the 5900X. As expected, the 16-core 32-thread 5950X is a power-hungry CPU, and the higher the power limit, the better. It does look like a limit of 95 watts or higher would be acceptable for taking advantage of the performance jump that the 5950X has over the 5900X. Now let's look at a comparison between the CPUs. For a fair comparison, I decided to use the Intel results with PL2 and PL1 at the same level only. Starting with Intel's Comet Lake, the 4-core i3 predictably falls far below the 10-core i9. Even at low power levels, the i9 does fairly well, and maintains a large advantage over the i3. The same cannot be said of Intel's Rocket Lake CPUs though. I can't really explain this graph, but what I can say is that the performance of the Rocket Lake CPUs is kind of all over the place with the i7 and i9 only having an advantage above 100 watts. Otherwise, the i5 seems to do just as well as its 8 core siblings at low to mid power levels. Here are all of the Intel CPUs tested on one graph. What we can learn here is that the Comet Lake i9 is better optimized than the Rocket Lake CPUs at lower power levels. It does fall behind a bit above 100 watts, however.
The AMD Vermeer chips show more variation. The Ryzen 7 does better than the Ryzen 5 at all power levels, but the Ryzen 9 CPUs only do better at the higher end of the graph, at 80 watts or higher. Above 100 watts is where the 5950X really shines. Instead of combining all of the AMD and Intel CPUs into one crowded graph, I will compare Intel to AMD by core count. Looking at the 6 core options, we can see that Intel does better at 35 watts, but falls far behind at any power level above that. The Intel CPU is less expensive, but it is very clear that AMD is on top here. And it's the same story with 8 cores. The i7 and i9 cannot really compete with the Ryzen 7, but Intel does keep gaining ground at the higher power levels. If the power limits are allowed to extend further above 125 watts, the i9's performance begins to approach the Ryzen 7. The Ryzen 7's price sits right in between the i7 and i9. I hope this data is useful. It certainly is for me when I make CPU or cooler recommendations. Limiting power to the CPU is a great way to keep its temperatures down, especially when CPU power use seems to go up and up with every generation. And if you really want to make a fanless PC with a particular case or cooler, hopefully you will have a better idea now of what CPU to choose to fit the appropriate power limit for that case or cooler. I plan to do similar testing with AMD's Cezanne Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 APUs. To get photos and test results of every one of my PC builds, check out my Patreon page. Like the video and subscribe for more fanless PC content, and visit Fully Silent PCs if you are interested in purchasing your own custom-built fanless PC.